I'm Paul De Palma. I'm a professor of computer science in the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Thank you for coming. And this <laughs> on a Saturday afternoon. Even one of my students is here. God, I gotta think about that, you know? Um, you know, keeping a professor down to 12 and a half minutes is, is, is tough. You know what I mean? I just, I just like to yak. So um, those of us of a certain age will get this reference, uh, open the pod door bay, Hal. It's, it's from 2001. If you might remember Hal, Hal is this, this um, malevolent computer here. And we have a little bit of Hal. You have to endure an advertisement before we can get to Hal. But he's in there. Have you ever had Deja, 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 Deja Vu? The headphone jack. Oh, this one, if you clip on side. Oh, okay. That's good part. That right there is fine. And it sounds like nothing is happening, but it is. That's enough. You can stop this guy now. I think you know what the problem is, Justin. <laughs> All right, the malevolent hell. So this is everyone's nightmare, right? To deal with you, 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 you have your computer opened up and it begins talking back to you in this kind of nasty and sugary sort of way. Well, you, you know, you'll be happy to know that that we're a long way from hell. Hell, by the way, I'm told, is is IBM pitched um, backward by one position. Somebody told me that a long time ago. I don't know if that's true. Well, we're not quite there yet uh, with automatic speech recognition, which is what I'm going to talk about here. But we're getting pretty good. Uh, if, if you were dealing, we had a machine that was dealing just with digits. You see that our error rate is very, very low. Uh, for red speech, that is, I'm reading from a book, it's also pretty good. Uh, by the time we get up to conversational telephone speech, uh, the error rate is 20%, and I think that that is, is, is way understated. I think it's probably close to 50% for, for uh, conversational speech. Uh, that's not good, right? And you all know that. You've all dealt with these systems. That, and I heard my wife yelling in the, in the, in the, in, in, uh, the kitchen one day, no, I'm not going to Brooklyn. <laughs> To, to the United Airlines thing. <laughs> anyway, OK, here's the idea. Here's the idea with automatic speech recognition. And you tell me if this makes sense to you. The notion is that we have this preformed notion, a preformed idea of a sentence that we're going to produce. We produce that sentence, and somehow or another, uh, it gets perturbed. That's the noisy channel. And then our system, among all possible sentences that might be produced, chooses the most probable one and outputs it. And the question is, is that how you talk? Is that how you think? Do you have a preformed sentence in your brain? If I did right now, I'd be in trouble. But it, it, it works a little bit. But I think there are problems with the model. So if we'll, oh, we have to know. You know, another trip down memory lane here, you know? If you could clip on, click on Jimmy's nose. Now listen really carefully to what he says. Yeah, that's about 15 or so would be good. OK, that's good right there. <laughs> Well, I, I'm slightly embarrassed to tell you that I spent a lot of mental energy 
at the time thinking, is Jimmy really saying, excuse me while I kiss, the, kiss this guy? <laughs> or, excuse me while I kiss this guy? You see, it sounds similar, doesn't it? And this is exactly why auto, uh, automatic speech, re speech, mm, speech recognition is difficult. It's all about disambiguation. Uh, this is a phenomenally difficult task. Um, I'm given this one simple example, but it, it exists everywhere in language. Um, here's, the, here's the problem with, 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 with the Jimi Hendrix song. There's no problem with the song, really. Um, Linguists refer to this as aspiration. The word, when T, the sound T, is word initial in tuna fish, it is what linguists call aspirated. If you hold your finger up to your mouth and say tuna fish, tuna fish, go ahead and do that, tuna fish, a little before, you know, about a couple of inches out, tuna fish, tuna fish, and you'll, you'll feel this puff of air. Now hold your finger up to your mouth and say starfish. And the puff of air is missing, but this time if you put your fingers up here in your vocal cords and say starfish, you'll feel a vibration. What happens is that the S, um, the, the S before the T causes, the, causes the, the aspiration to become unaspirated and causes the vocal cords to vibrate. The same thing happens with K and G. By the way, if you say K and K, You'll notice that they're said with the same piece of your mouth. Your tongue is kind of pressed up at the back of your throat. K in ga. It's, it's, it's identical, actually. The only difference is the vocal cords are vibrating with the ga sound. Well, this sky, sky should be aspirated. The K's are aspirated. And the S before uh, the, the, the K causes the, the, the non-aspiration. The and it sounds like, excuse me while I kiss this guy, you see. Geeks like this kind of thing. But anyway. <laughs> anyway. All right, well, what do we do? What do we do? I know all of us, because I went through the same educational system that you did, we were taught that language is a system of rules. Well, instead of thinking of it a, is, as a system of rules, you know, T makes this kind of sound, uh, to whom is correct, to who is incorrect, think of it um, actually is a collection of probabilities. Then speech recognition becomes this conditional probability. Don't get put off by this thing. It's really not a very big deal. You can read it. The hypothesized word sequence is that sequence in the target language with the greatest probability given an entire sequence of acoustic events. If you say a bunch of things to me, I want my recognizer to choose the best possible one. Okay. Well, this is great to formalize this mathematically, and this may, this may be pleasing to a mathematician, uh, but I don't know what to do with it. I can't compute that. Well, lucky for us, Parson Bayes from the 18th century comes and rescues us. He's the author of uh, many other things, uh, uh, including di divine benevolence or an attempt to prove that the principal end of divine providence and government is the happiness of his creatures. <laughs> you know, they were, they, were, they were a more hopeful people in the 18th century. <laughs> well, anyway, anyway, um, he's not remembered for his, his, his book on, on deny, divine benevolence, but it is said that, that he worked, he dabbled in probability theory because he wanted to prove the certitude of the Gospels. I don't know how successful, you know, how well he did with that, but he did come up with Bayes' rule, which has uh, remained with us, though low these almost 300 years. And it goes like this. The probability of some event, x, given some previous event, y, is just the probability of that previous event, y, given an event, x, times the probability of x over the probability of y. That can be worked out, and it's not all that hard to do. But if we plug our, our uh, argmax formula from the, from the last page into this thing, we get this wonderful second expression here, which says the probability of a sequence of acoustic observations given a word sequence times the probability of a word sequence defined or divided by the probability of the acoustic observations. Now, it turns out this is way, way, way easier to compute uh, 
And the reason being is that we have a big corpora, a big corpus of data, uh, of, of spoken language, and we can associate, we have energetic graduate students who, who, who annotate this, saying the sound t means the, you know. Um, and we, in fact, uh, uh, can describe then this, this probability of acoustic observations given a word sequence. Well, we can even do better than that. This uh, probability of acoustic observations is over all possible, of all the candidate uh, word sequences we want to judge from. The acoustic observation doesn't change. You're listening to me right now. You're hearing a sequence of acoustic observations, and you're trying to disambiguate what um, I'm rambling on about, but it's one set of acoustic observations, so we can just get rid of the denominator. And we get this thing, which turns out to be fairly easy to compute. This is what a large vocabulary continuous speech recognition system looks like. And if you can look up here, you'll see that probability of the acoustic observations given the word sequence. And over here, the probability of the word sequence. This one, collectively, the probability of the acoustic observation given the word sequence is referred to as the, the acoustic model. And this one over here is referred to as, a, as the language model. Okay? And out the other side, we pass it through a, another algorithm, and out the other side comes a little snippet from the twelfth night that we all know, if music be the food of love, play on. Well, okay. How am I doing on time here? We don't know. Okay. Um, my own work asks this basic question. Is the assumption with all of this, I'm not sure if you, could, if you saw this or not. You'd have to think about this a bit. Uh, the assumption with these LVCSR systems is, is that speech is just transcribed writing. And I ask this question, is it? And the next question is really, what does speech look like when you see it? You see this kind of thing all the time. I just took this out of the New York Times. Um, this is a quote. Well, this is a real LVCSR. That is a real uh, large vocabulary continuous speech recognizer. That is a human being. And he, pres he presumably is talking to someone, and he's reported this. Do people really talk like that? This is what they talk like. This is what speech sounds like. This is the very first segment from a very important corpus of speech called the, the Buckeye Corpus. And it's full of these restarts, you know. I, I start to say something, then I go back to the sentence, and I mend, and I start over again. It's full of ums and uhs. And in my case, my case, because I'm particularly excited now, I have a nice audience, uh, I, find that, I find that I'm, I'm uh, slurring consonants, which is too bad, but it is a talk about speech, after all. That's what speech looks like. So if speech looks like that, this licenses us to do some other things that we weren't licensed to do otherwise. Um, there is this implicit bias in speech recognition towards writing. Now, writing is a technology, and it was developed 3,000 years ago. And we are so literate in this culture that we can't imagine a culture in which there is not writing. But in fact, our, our speech is, 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 is uh, really prescript. For instance, a, a sentence like this one, uh, John sold the motorcycle. A sentence like that is very rare in speech, a sentence in which there is, is uh, a complete noun, a complete action word, and a, and a, complete, a complete direct object. It's very rare. It's full of uh, things like I. I've probably said I 600 times throughout this, this talk so far. It's full of these, these uh, what linguists refer to as disfluencies. So anyway, anyway, it doesn't sound like John sold the motorcycle. Well, here's my hypothesis. Uh, that human speech performance does not include transcription into text. It's neither sanitized, nor li like that, like that uh, New York Times piece that I showed you, nor is it raw like the Buckeye Corpus. So here's my hypothesis. 
If instead of trying to recognize words, we instead try to recognize syllables, why would we do that? So, well, there are many, many fewer syllables than words in English, so they're easier to hit. It's a much, much larger target. And then if we can map that syllable string toward, uh, onto something that I'm calling a concept string, and this is really kind of horrifying, but, but in fact, I think we do something like this. Um, I'm, I'm using a concept to be this big bucket in which I dump a bunch of words that mean similar things, like go is in a travel reservation system, is fly, flying, going to fly, flew, go to, traveling. I don't have to recognize any of that stuff anymore. What I mean if I'm talking to a travel agent is go. Specifically what I mean uh, if I'm talking to an online travel agent. This is what we're trying to build here. Uh, you see it's an entire system. It begins up there with a the user. And all of my stuff, our stuff, is, is uh, shaded. The other business here uh, either comes from a conventional automatic speech recognition system or uh, is, it's, it's part of this knowledge domain system which you, you, would, you can buy commercially. Uh, and we are cruising right along on this. We've been working on this thing for, for uh, a couple of years now, anyway. Uh, Here's Noam Chomsky. He's the presiding genius over contemporary linguistics. And much of the work that I do is in utter opposition to Chomsky's work. And he is a formidable foe. He's the, the world's smartest human being, in my opinion. <laughs> you, he does not suffer fools gladly. If, he, if I were here, I'm sure he would shred me <laughs> or something like that. He said many years ago, it must be recognized that the notion probability of a sentence is entirely a useless one under any known interpretation of the term. And my thought is that he just didn't bother to count. These, these uh, corpora of language weren't available to him when he started making his, when, well, when he made this sentence, which was in the late 60s. Now, oh, before we go into this thing, there is, there is one irony that I hope isn't lost on anybody, and, and that's this. We're using this 19th century invention, the QWERTY keyboard, to access a 20th century device. I mean, it's just crazy on the face of it. It is, you know. So maybe we're not going to get HAL. Maybe we don't even want to get HAL. I probably don't. I don't even have a smartphone. But we could do a lot better, a lot better than we're doing. I'd like to thank my, my two collaborators. These are the two guys that I work with. Uh, Dr. Charles Wooters, he's a senior researcher at the International Computer Science Institute um, at Berkeley, af affiliated with the Computer Science Department at the University of California. And Dr. George Luger, who's the chair of the Computer Science Department at the University of New Mexico. And of course, thank you for your patience, for dealing with my rambling. <laughs> so, maybe we have a few minutes, I don't know. Thank you, Paul. Okay. We have another speaker to get prepped for. Can you talk? Yes. I have a question. How much has this evolved in the last 10 years? And when do you see it going in the next 10 years? Oh, when, when will you solve this? What will be finally a full recognition? Okay, well, it's, it's evolved dramatically. There, there were dram as soon as we began to introduce probabilistic models into speech recognition in the late 80s and early 90s, things really took off. Now what's happened, as what happens with all these kind of engineering scientific discoveries, is that it's plateaued. So, so there really are not dramatic advances occurring in speech recognition right now uh, with this probabilistic model. Somebody has to come up with something new. I'm hoping this thing that I'm doing will, will inch us forward a bit. Uh, whether we're ever going to get to hell is, seems like an open question. You know, computer scientists are, 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 especially people in artificial intelligence like myself, are notorious for being optimists, predicting in 10 years uh, who knows what's going to happen. I think we'll get a lot better with this stuff, whether we'll have, ever have anything that approaches, uh, that approaches hell is, is, to me, doubtful, but, but I'm not sure. Okay, maybe one more. So, um, I, I guess part of the problem of 
speech recognition it also has to do with access and how yeah, do you it does. Cope with that? It does. Because it does. I mean, if, if you're doing standard English, whatever. Uh, okay. Yes. You're challenged by the language. Yeah, challenged tremendously. It, 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 yeah, it does. It does, and that's why that's why uh, these systems. If you've ever used a dictation system like Dragon, naturally speaking. It does very well. I mean, you can train, and it does very well with, with conversational English because you've trained it on a single voice. Now, uh, Apple Diction does pretty well, too, because Apple has this volume. Every time you speak something in Apple Diction, Apple scarfs it up and sticks it in their corpus, and then, and then the, the computer get, is getting trained on it. So the larger, the, the greater the number of sounds the computer system hears, the better it's going to do. And I think that's been the problem so far, that, that, that speech recognizers and, and people in the, res in, the, in the research community have used relatively small corpora, you know, a few hours. Google, on the other hand, has all the world's information. And it's why Google Translate does pretty well, doesn't gr do great, it does pretty well. And, 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 and Apple Diction does pretty well too. So I think, the I, I think that that, that, uh, that will be one piece of it, having larger corpora that we can train our systems on, I think.